ungodly man digs up evil, and it is on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. He winks his eye to devise perverse things. He compresses his lips and brings about evil. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Good morning. Glad to see everybody today. We had an interesting day yesterday, didn't we? We didn't get much snow up where I live, though, only about a, a, an inch maybe at the most, half an inch or so. We didn't get much there, but I understand some other folks got quite a bit. But today is different. Today is warmer, and all the snow will be gone, and soon, hopefully, spring will be here. Uh, so we're glad to see you today, and if you're visiting with us, we just want to uh, welcome you and, and thank you for coming, and we invite your questions and comments. If you should see or hear anything today that you don't understand, bring that to our attention. We'd be happy to sit down and discuss it with you with an open mind and an open Bible. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to be preaching about gambling. Uh, Proverbs 16.33 uh, has been used by some as justification for gambling. That's the reason I had that passage read. I didn't want to just have our reader just read the one verse, and so I brought in the other passages as well. But verse 33 is really the one we're interested in for our lesson. Uh, the Bible says the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And so they say, see, they had lotteries in the Bible. Uh, but what people don't seem to understand is that the lot, the casting of lots in Scripture was actually a method of divine revelation. Of course, revelation has ceased. God is no longer revealing any new things to us. It's all contained in the Bible now. But in the days of revelation, one way in which God revealed His will was through the casting of lots. That's how uh, a replacement for Judas was found for the apostles, was by the casting of lots. And there are many other examples of that in Scripture. So it falls short, really, to use this passage as justification for a lottery or for gambling. Oh, and by the way, uh, for those of you who are sticklers out there, I'm well aware that that's not a picture of a lottery. I, I understand that. That's a roulette wheel. But my sermon is about gambling in general. There are lots of different ways to gamble. There are roulette wheels, and there's card games, and there uh, is lotteries and things of that nature. Uh, but the other night when I was given my invitation, I think it was last Sunday night, I talked about the worst kind of gambler there ever was. And we may mention that fellow again later on today. But that's the man who gambles with his soul. And then after uh, services were over, I was talking with somebody and they said, you know, I haven't heard a sermon on gambling in a long time. And I got to thinking, well, I haven't preached on gambling in quite a long time. So I just thought I'd just do a sermon on gambling. In 1989, if I remember correctly, was when the lottery became legal in Indiana. Before that, it was illegal. For some of you young people who were born after 1989, you may not be aware of that. But before 1989, gambling was illegal in Indiana. It was illegal in a lot of places. And over the years, more and more states have fallen to uh, the garbage that's fed to us by politicians. Well, if we could just have a lottery, it will fix all of our roads. Well, have you seen the roads lately? Uh, if we could just have a lottery, it will fix our education system. Well, is it fixed yet? No. And so, but we fell for it, didn't we? People fell for it and said, yeah, that would be great. That's what we want. And one state after another has fallen for that. Uh, and the title of my lesson came, comes from a commercial that came out in 1989 for Village Pantry. And this was when the lottery was first legalized. And the commercial started out something like this. Hey, guys, did you know that Village Pantry sells lottery tickets? And then across the screen, thanks a lottery came. And so I use that as the title of this lesson. And a lot of people believe that because gambling is legal, it is therefore moral. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are a lot of things that are legal in this world that are not necessarily moral. Abortion is legal in the United States of America, but it is not moral. It is murder. And so there's nothing moral about it. 
Homosexuality is legal in the United States. Homosexual marriage is legal in the United States, but they are not moral acts. They are immoral acts. They are sinful things. So obviously, legal does not mean moral. And we as Christians had better wake up to this fact. And so in this lesson, I want us to think a little bit about gambling, about the sin of gambling. I'll just say that it is a sin. I don't think any Christian should be involved in gambling in any way, shape, or form. And so we're going to be looking at the scriptures uh, to discuss why that is true. Now, point number one is going to take up an entire chart. For those of you who are taking notes, this is point number one on your outline. And point one is the reasons why gambling is not wrong. Over the years, I've heard a lot of silly arguments made about why gambling is wrong. And none of these reasons is really why gambling is wrong. First of all, and this, is, this goes back many years, but a lot of old-time Christians used to think that gambling was wrong because of the devices that were used. For example, playing cards, or rolling dice, uh, or playing pool, or, or, or having a sporting event, or racing horses. Or, and so a lot of times people would associate those activities themselves with sin. And a lot of, some of you may even remember uh, back years ago, there were Christians who would say, oh, it's wrong to play card games. Well, why? Well, because it's gambling. That's what they would say, because it's gambling. Well, no, no, no. A card game in and of itself is not gambling. Now, you might gamble on the card game, uh, and that would be wrong, but a card game in and of itself is not gambling. Uh, people would say, a lot of the old-time Christians would say, well, playing pool is sinful. Well, why? Because it's gambling. No, playing pool in and of itself is not sinful. Playing pool in and of itself is not gambling. Now, if you were to wager on the outcome of the game, then you would be gambling, you see. There is a fundamental difference. And a lot of old Christians used to say, well, you can't play board games with dice. Well, why? Well, that's gambling, they would say. No, it's not. Playing a board game with dice is not gambling unless you're wagering on how uh, the dice turns up. That's the difference, you see, that people fail to see, and on and on it goes. So it's not wrong because of the devices that are used. Gambling is not wrong because someone's taking a risk. I've heard that, and sometimes I hear people say that to try to defend gambling. Well, everything has risk. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Walking down the street has risk. It sure does. Going to work has risk. It sure does. Driving down the road has risk. Why, it surely does. And so people would say, see there, we can gamble. Excuse me. I don't think you're thinking this through. Let's think about everything has a risk. A risk is not a gamble. There is a huge difference between a risk and a gamble. A gamble is a wager placed on a risk. There's a chance, a risk, that it might rain tomorrow. That's not a gamble. But if I bet you $5 it's going to rain tomorrow, ha ha ha, you see now we're stumbling on what gambling really is. Gambling is a wager that's placed on a risk. It's not the risk itself, it's a wager or a bet that's placed on a risk. That's gambling. And so risk in and of itself is not the problem. All of life has risk to it. Gambling is not wrong because of the amount of money. Sometimes people say, well, it's just penny any poker. It's not like we're gambling with $10 bills and $20 bills. It's just penny any poker. Well, that's not what makes it wrong. The amount of money is not what makes it wrong. And if it is, I want you to tell me at what point is it wrong. Is it wrong with pennies? Is it wrong with dimes? Is it wrong with quarters? Is it wrong with dollar bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, $20 bills? When does it become wrong? And then I'm not going to stop there. Why? Why? Why does it become wrong between $5 and $20? Why does it become wrong between a penny and a $100 bill? What makes the difference here? And so I'm saying to you that the amount of money wagered is really not the issue. It's wrong in principle, in and of itself. And the amount of money has nothing to do with it. Well, sometimes say, people will say, well, we're gambling, yeah, but it's for a good cause. We're having a raffle to raise money for this cause or to raise money for that cause. And so we, we kid ourselves into thinking that because it's for a good cause, it's okay to gamble. Nothing could be further from the truth. In Romans chapter 3, just pulling a statement here just to illustrate a point here from Romans 3 and verse 8. Paul says, and this is what people were saying about Christians in the first century, because they believed in the grace of God, the favor and, and, the, and the mercy of God. And so uh, people were accused falsely of believing this in verse 8. He says, why not say, let us do evil that good may come. 
as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. Paul is saying that whole statement, let's do evil that good may come, is false. And it brings condemnation. And yet that's what people are saying here. Well, it's for a good cause. In other words, let's do evil that good may come. That's not going to work, folks. That's not going to work. And so you can't defend gambling on the basis that it's for a good cause. And here's one more thing. And a lot of people will say this about a lot of issues. Well, you can't find in the Bible any place where it says, Thou shalt not gamble. That's right. I'll admit that to you. I'll admit that to you. There's no specific prohibition in Scripture that says, Thou shalt not gamble. But think that through. I can't find any place in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not bootleg whiskey. Thou shalt not manufacture bootleg whiskey, and thou shalt not sell bootleg whiskey. But I dare say it's wrong. It's wrong. We shouldn't do that. Well, you can't find any place in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not abort a baby. The word abortion does not appear in the Bible. And yet I dare say that it's wrong because murder is murder regardless of who you're murdering or how you're murdering. It's still wrong. It's still murder. You can't find in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not beat your children. Can you? You find that statement in the Bible? And yet I'm willing to say that's wrong. That's wrong. And I, and I, don't, I don't think anybody would disagree with me that that's wrong. And so just because something is not spelled out specifically in Scripture does not mean that it's okay. And so I wanted to get that out of the way because a lot of times people use these things to defend gambling or to say that's why gambling is wrong and trying to throw the whole thing off track. Gambling is not wrong for any of these reasons right here. We've got to understand that. Well, why is it wrong? Why is gambling wrong? First of all, I would suggest to you that gambling is something that is very addictive. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 12. Paul lays down a very important principle that has broad application. Now, he's making a specific application in context here. But he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. Stop. He's saying it might be lawful, but it might not be a helpful or proper thing for you to do. Did you catch that? That's a very important principle. And then he modifies it further. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That's a principle of addiction, isn't it? And Paul's saying, I'm not going to allow myself to be addicted to anything. I might have the right to do it. It might be lawful for me to do it, but I'm not going to allow myself to be brought under anything's power. That has broad application. You could apply that to drinking. You could apply that to gambling. You could apply that to smoking. You can apply that to a lot of things, things that are addictive, things that can bring us under its power. Now, in the context here, and let's be careful as we look at this, he says all things are lawful. Let's just understand it. He doesn't mean to say here fornication is lawful. He doesn't mean to say that adultery is lawful. He doesn't mean to say here that murder is lawful. All things is limited by its context. Well, how do you know that, Lanny? Well, let's back up a couple of verses here. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. None of those things are lawful. None of those things are lawful. And so when he says all things are lawful, two verses, three verses later, he's not including those things. Well, what is he talking about? Well, look at the next verse, verse 13. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. That's what he means by the statement all things. He's talking about meats and foods. And what he's doing to the Corinthians is showing how they've taken that statement and abused it like people do today. And so all things are lawful basically is saying something might be right and lawful, technically speaking. However, there may be limits to that. It may not be a helpful thing for you to do. And I'm looking again at verse 12. And it may be something that brings you under its power. And if something is addictive or brings you under its power, then it is wrong. And gambling is one of those things. Many a home, many a family has been ruined because the husband or the wife is addicted to gambling. Can't stay out of the casino. Uh, can't stay out of the place where you buy the lottery tickets. Just has to keep doing it. Has to keep doing it because they're addicted. And you think, well, prove that to me, preacher. Well, there's an organization called Gamblers Anonymous. Ever heard of it? It's patterned very much after Alcoholics Anonymous, structured in much the same way. Why does that organization exist? Why is there an organization called Gamblers Anonymous? Because gambling is addictive. And sometimes people get addicted to it. And that should be a big red flag to us. If this is potentially addictive, I don't want nothing to do with it. 
I don't want nothing to do with anything that's going to bring me under its power. I'm going to steer clear of that. I'm going to stay away from that. And then we see all these billboards, and you've seen them, and sometimes TV commercials, and they'll advertise the lottery, and you always hear that little thing at the very end, play responsibly. <laughs> well, why are you telling me that? <laughs> why are you telling me to play responsibly? Because you might get addicted. That's why. The state knows that. That's why they tack that onto those commercials. Play responsibly. Well, if gambling is not addictive, I don't need that, that advice. But the fact that that advice is given, the fact that Gamblers Anonymous exists as an organization and survives as an organization is testament to the fact that gambling is addictive. And therefore, I would suggest something that we should stay away from. Something else that occurs to me, gambling is detrimental to your influence as a Christian. And I think that's very, very important. You might, going to point number one, you might say, well, I've got control of myself. It's never going to bring me into its power. I, I, I'll never be addicted to gambling. But think about the example you set for somebody else. And what if that somebody else saw you gambling and they weren't as strong as you and they became addicted? Your example has led them to sin. You've caused them to sin. You've caused them to stumble. And that's the whole point that's being brought out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The issue is different. The issue here is eating meats, another lawful activity, and yet one fraught with difficulties in the first century. In 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 through 13, he says, But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware. So, verse 8, it's technically okay, verse 9, but be careful, beware, lest somehow this liberty or freedom of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. What do you mean, Paul? Well, if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. When you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now, you can apply that to more things than just food and meat. You can apply that to a lot of things. And your influence can be detrimental. If you're not setting an, a real solid example of Christianity, you might harm somebody. You might cause them to sin. You might cause them to be addicted. And think about this from the standpoint of, of influence. Most of the world, even though they, they may not be believers in Christ, most of the world recognizes gambling as a vice. They really do. And here, let's give, me a, a, give you a passage on this just to illustrate it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Even worldly people have standards. Their standards may not be the same as ours, but they have standards. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, we have an illustration of that. There's a congregation who was tolerating fornication in their midst, tolerating sexual immorality in their midst. He says in verse 1, It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. This is an incestuous relationship. A man has his father's wife, you see. And he says, well, even the Gentiles don't do that. If the Gentiles have standards, their standards may not be like ours, but even they won't do that. They won't stoop that low. And so most of the world, bringing, plugging that idea in over here, most of the world sees gambling as a vice. And I've got a ready-made life experience illustration for you. Years ago, I used to work up at Industrial Dielectrics in Noblesville, Indiana. I was a lab manager and QC manager and a technical manager while I was there. And so... Uh, it was an interesting job, but preaching is much better. I like it much better. But anyway, while I was there, when I first started, I was not a Christian. And all of the employees had this little thing they called a check pool. Maybe some of you are aware of that kind of thing. Maybe where you work, a check pool. And you get your paycheck on Friday, and it's got that little check number. And everybody would put a dollar or two into the pot, whatever it was. I don't remember how much it was back then. But you put a dollar or two into the pot, and whoever had the best poker hand with their check number won the pot. And so just gambling is all that it was. But an interesting thing happened. I used to participate in that, by the way, when I, before I was a Christian. But somewhere along the way while I was working there, I became a Christian. And mysteriously, nobody was asking me anymore to participate in the check pool. Wonder why? 
I wonder why none of my friends who used to come around and say, Lanny, you want to be in the check pool this week? Suddenly they know I'm a Christian and they stop asking me. I didn't have to ask them to stop asking me. They just stopped asking me. Why did they do that? Well, they did that because most of the world knows gambling is a vice. And that gambling is not something that Christians do. Most of the world knows that. In fact, I, I dare say that if some sinner saw you buying a lottery ticket someplace, they'd probably point that out. I thought you were a Christian, wouldn't they? You know they would. You know good and well they would, wouldn't you? I thought you were a Christian. Why are you buying a lottery ticket? And by the way, while you're standing in that line, and isn't that annoying, by the way, you go in the gas station, all I want to do is go in here and buy me a Pepsi, and you're standing in line behind five people, and they've got to buy 15 lottery tickets. I want some of this, and, and I want some of those. And then they'll stand there and scratch them off, and you, all I want to do is pay for my Pepsi and get out of here. But no, and then the next guy, he's got to buy five more, and scratch them off while he's there. I think I'll try one more, and you've got to go through all that. What an annoyance that is, all right? But while you're standing there waiting in the line, say that guy behind you and say, can I talk to you about Jesus? How far do you think you're going to get with that fellow? You, you know good and well he's not interested in Jesus. He's interested in buying a lottery ticket. Try and talk to, to somebody about salvation while standing in line to buy a lottery ticket. Try and talk to him about Jesus. Try and talk to him about the Bible. See how far you get. Because they know that's not what Christians do. A couple of passages here. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. Paul gives good advice to a young man which is actually good for everybody. He says in 1 Timothy 4, 12, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example. You know, that's good advice for young people, but that's good advice for old people and good advice for everybody in between. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, and in buying lottery tickets. That's conspicuously absent there, isn't it? Because that's not being a good example. And I think most people understand that. I think most people grasp that simple truth. In James 1 and verse 27, he says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There are things the world does that will bring a stain and a spot upon us if we do them. And we must not do those things. We must stay away from those things. And so there's another reason why gambling is wrong. Not only that, but gambling bears bad fruit. You cannot, I, it would take us months to go into detail on all of the terrible fruits that are borne by gambling. I'm going to just kind of scratch the surface on some of these things just to make the point. But you could actually just spend months and months just talking about all the terrible things that come about because of the habit of gambling. In Matthew chapter 7, just to set the stage here, Matthew chapter 7 the Lord was warning about false prophets. But he lays down a principle that goes beyond just false prophets. He says this in verse, Matthew 7, verse 16, reading down to verse 20. You will know them by their fruits. That's our point here. Look at the fruits. And you'll know whether this is good or bad, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's true or false, just by looking at the fruits. What do you mean, Jesus? Well, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? No, that's silly. That doesn't make any sense. Do men gather figs from thistles? No, that doesn't make any sense. Even so, like that's true, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, we're going to examine in a moment whether gambling is a good tree or a bad tree. That's what we're going to talk about here in just a second. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits... You shall know them. One other passage we'll bring in here, 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verses 9 and 10. I'm just bringing out some passages before we expand on this. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. He says, Those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation and a snare. Here's, here's the fruits, the bad fruits of, of desiring to be rich. They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some, having strayed from the faith in their greediness, have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, what are some of these bad fruits? Sometimes people, in, in an effort to win a gambling game, they will engage in fraud, fraudulent activity. They cheat, in other words. <laughs> they will cheat. At gam there are cheating gamblers. 
We've even seen that on television, haven't you? You got the old guys sitting at the saloon playing cards at the table, and they find out one of them's got cards shoved up his sleeve. He's cheating, isn't he? He's cheating, and then they, there's a gunfight, and then somebody's killed, so sin upon sin. And so there is fraud, fraudulent activities, because people sometimes cheat in an attempt to try and win the big pot. And then I was telling somebody the other day, I don't remember who I was talking to, but anytime you have a big pot of collective money, there's potential for crime and abuse. Witness the federal government. <laughs> you got a big pot of collective money. Now, in, in, in the case of, of, of gambling, sometimes people are in charge of those lottery resources. There's somebody in charge of that. And then you'll find a newspaper article, well, so-and-so, who was the head of the lottery, was embezzling funds from the lottery commission. And he goes to jail. And why is that? Because he got tempted by that big pot of money that was sitting there, you see. And that's one of the evils of gambling. It's one of the bad fruits of gambling. Sometimes there are people who will bribe lottery officials and gambling officials to win. There's bribery that goes on. Then you get your winnings. You win a big one tonight, and you're walking home with your winnings in your pocket, and someone knocks you in the head and steals your winnings. Thievery is tied to gambling because people know that there are going to be people leaving that casino, leaving that gambling place with a pot full of money, a pocket full of money. So all I got to do is knock him in the head and take it. And there are people who do that. Sometimes they'll go as far as murdering you. That's another fruit of gambling. I will shoot you and kill you to steal your winnings. Sometimes there are sexual immorality connected with gambling. And they do this to gain favors for cheating purposes. And again, all of these things, and we could go on and on and on. And how about just bring it right home to a family. How many people have you known or heard of or read about in the news who have committed suicide because they lost everything gambling? They had everything staked on winning that big pot, and they lost it, and they lost everything they had, and they got no recourse, and they're so depressed, and they go and they kill themselves. That's one of the fruits of gambling. How many families have you, do, have you known or heard about that have been brought to poverty because the husband or the wife can't stop gambling, just can't stay away, just can't stop doing it, and the family is brought to poverty because of that? He makes big money, makes good money, but he wastes it all on gambling. Neglect of the family because money that could be spent providing for my wife and providing for my children is spent in the casinos and gambling. And so there's the neglect of the family. And then, finally, there's the wife or the husband who has enough of that and says, I'm done. And they get a divorce. Now, I'm not defending that because the Scripture doesn't allow that as a cause for divorce. But folks, we all know what happens, don't we? I know of a lady right now, a member of the church. Her husband couldn't stop gambling. And finally, she said, that's enough. And I divorced him. And so she got rid of him. I'm not saying that that's a right thing to do, but I'm saying that's one of the fruits of gambling. There, there is no good thing that comes out of this. Nothing. Not one good thing. And then think about this. Suppose you're a, a member of the church and you're one of these guys who just thinks I, I, I'm pre preaching a lot of nonsense. And you're going to go ahead and play. What happens if you win? You put the church in a spot, haven't you? Now we've got to discipline you. And, you know, there are churches who will do that, but there are churches who say, well, I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't discipline him because, after all, we might get a little bit of that money he won. He won that $8 million pot. He might send a million dollars our way. Let's not discipline him yet. And so one thing upon another upon another, and, and like I said, you could go on with this and you could dig into details and you could go on with that one point for days, maybe even weeks talking about all of the bad fruits of gambling. One after another after another. Families destroyed, marriages destroyed, people in poverty, people committing suicide, people being robbed, people, funds being embezzled. It just goes on and on and on. There's nothing good about this. It bears bad fruits. I would also suggest to you that gambling betrays evil motives. Why do people do this? Why, what, what is it that gets into people that causes them to want to do this? I would suggest to you that the primary motive behind gambling is covetousness. That's the primary motive behind it. Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Now, I didn't say, by the way, that that was the only motive. There are a, min a number of motives, but I'd say the primary motive behind it is covetousness. And in Colossians 3 verses 5 and 6, 
Paul says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Think about that fellow that gets addicted. I, there are people, there are people in this world who will drive, and you don't have to do it now because it's legal in the state, but before it was legal in Indiana, there were people who would drive for miles, go across the state line into a state that has a legal lottery, and spend their last dime on a one in five million chance to win the eight million dollar pot. There are people who do that. That's how tied they are to it. They'll spend their last dime on a one in five million chance to win the big one, and then their last dime is gone because you're not going to you're not going to win that one in five million chance. You're you're not going to be the one to win that. It doesn't work that way. And why? Why? Covetousness. That's why. A couple of other passages in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus was talking here about sowing the Word of God in the hearts of men and women, but He talks about the different kinds of heart, the parable of the sower, different kinds of hearts. And there are some people who get so caught up in this world that God's Word can't take any real root. In Matthew 13, verse 33, He who sowed seed among the thorns, in this parable, by the way, remember the seed is the Word of God. He who sowed seed among the thorns is he who hears the Word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. That person has lost all sense of spirituality because he's got something more important on his mind. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Covetousness, in other words. Covetousness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, this would be a lesson for all of us here, uh, even beyond gambling. We are a prosperous people. We are a prosperous nation. I dare say there isn't a person in this room who's starving. There, there, is, there just isn't. We're prosperous. We're doing well. We need to remember something in 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this world not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You want to trust in somebody? Trust in God. Don't trust in the lottery. Don't trust in your covetousness. Don't trust in getting riches in this evil way. Don't put your faith in that kind of thing. You're betraying evil motives within yourself. And then there's always the problem of stewardship. This, that's behind all of this. The person who's wasting his money on law, you're just throwing your money away. I've made the similar argument on, on people for people who smoke. You know, a, people, a, a pack of cigarettes, what, five bucks now? And someone who smokes two packs a day, you're just taking $10 and, and burning it. You may as well just take that $10 and lay it in an ashtray and light it. And, and then you multiply that every day, 70 dollars a week and then four weeks two hundred and eighty dollars a month that'll buy a lot of groceries but all you're doing is lighting it and burning it up same thing with gambling same thing with gambling you take that money that you're spending on on, on casinos and lottery tickets and various gambling games and you just may as well light it and burn it for all the good that it's going to be poor stewardship and that brings us to Luke 16 we're commanded to be stewards of our financial resources. And in Luke 16 verses 1 and 2, the Bible reminds us that we're going to be called into account for how we've handled the things God have blessed us with. And he said this to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that he was wasting his goods. So he called him and he said, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship or you can no longer be steward. You know, one of these days God's going to say that to you. Give an account of your stewardship, the money I've blessed you with, the family I've blessed you with, the things I've blessed you with. Give an account. Have you wasted it? Have you blown it? Have you thrown it away? Have you squandered it on gambling? And so the evil motives that come to play here. I like this verse in Proverbs 30. I, I, I just like to read it and think about it every so often. Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, because we get so caught up in money and on money and thinking about money and more money. And we forget sometimes what's really important. So I like these verses here. Proverbs 30, verses 7, 8, and 9. It's a prayer. Two things I request of you. Do not deprive me before I die. Number one, remove falsehood and lies far from me. Number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. Did you see what he just said there? I like that prayer. Today in this world, it's give me riches. Give me riches. More, more, more. I need more. I want more. I've got to have more. No, that's not what the guy says. He says, I don't want, I don't want either one. 
You get what he's saying here? Give me neither poverty nor rich. I don't want to be dirt poor. I don't know anybody that does. Who, who wants to be dirt poor? Nobody wants to be there. But he also says, I don't want to be filthy rich either. I don't, and there's a reason. Let's read the rest of the verse here. First of all, he says, feed me with the food you prescribe. I trust you, Lord. Give me what you think I can handle. Give me what you think. If you think I can handle more, I'll take it. But if you don't think I can handle it, please don't give it to me. And what's the problem? What, what, why, what are the problems here? Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? That's the danger of riches. I don't need the Lord. I am rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. I don't need the Lord. Or, on the other end, if you're dirt poor, I might be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, people sometimes justify this. Well, he stole, but he was poor. Well, this verse doesn't justify that. He says, I may be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. It's still wrong, even if you're poor. And so, don't get so caught up on money. Don't get so caught up on things. Don't get so caught up on covetousness. And that's what gambling is all about, folks. It's all about covetousness. Now, I'm going to bring one final point in here. And I think this is a very important point that we don't think about often enough. And that is gambling is just flat out not authorized in Scripture. We've been studying on Sunday night Bible authority. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You've got to have authority for what you do. And I'm going to suggest to you that in Scripture there's only three legitimate ways of getting money. And I'm going to parallel that just so you get the point here. We talk about the three works of the church, don't we? Three works of the local church. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. And we say that's it. It's only limited to that. If a church gets involved in something else, they're not doing what God said. They're acting without authority. So if a church is involved in social activities, they're outside the pale. If a church is involved in recreational activities, they're outside the pale. Three works of the church. Well, in a similar manner, there are three ways, legitimate ways, that you can get money in this world. And did you notice gambling's not on the list? <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> There's, it's not in the Scripture. It's not on the list. You're not authorized to do that. There are three ways you're authorized to get money. The first one is the law of labor, Ephesians 4.28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that which is good, that he may have whereof to give him that hath need. The law of labor. We all get up and we go to work and we do our jobs and we receive a paycheck. The law of labor. And then there is the law of exchange, James 4.13. Come now, ye who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. That's the law of exchange. Nothing wrong with that. That's called capitalism. It always bugs me when I hear on the news or people say, well, they made all these profits. Really? Surprise? Are you surprised? That's what they're in business for, is to make profit, to buy and sell and make a profit. That's called capitalism. There's nothing wrong with that. It's biblical. There's nothing wrong with that. The law of exchange. And then there's the law of giving. You can give money to somebody. I cited an illustration of that. Let's go back and read that. The idea of receiving an inheritance. If you receive an inheritance, basically what your parents or whoever it is that have, have bequeathed this to you have done is give it to you. You didn't earn that inheritance. Don't ever forget that, by the way. You didn't earn that inheritance. They gave it to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14, Paul says, Now is the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours but you. And then to illustrate his point, he says this, For the children ought not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He's alluding to the idea of an inheritance. And parents have worked all their life, and they've got this house, and they've got this money, and they've got this. And when they die, they usually will bequeath that to their children or somebody like that. That's a gift. The law of giving. You can give money to somebody. You can engage in buying and selling and trying to make a profit. That's business. That's capitalism. Or you can work and draw a paycheck. That's how you get your money. That's how it's done. That's biblical. But gambling is not on the list. Gambling is not authorized. You have no permission from God to gamble. And I think that's a pretty potent argument. I think that's pretty powerful. Christians should not gamble along with all the earthly misery, we may lose our soul. Remember Jesus said something like this, What does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What if you hit the big one? What if you win that $8 million pot and lose your soul in the process? Is that a fair trade to you? I don't think so. Not for me. 
And then as we slip into the invitation, I want to remind you of my invitation last Sunday, just very briefly. The worst kind of gambler of all is the man or woman who gambles with their own soul. I still got time. I, God isn't going to come back today. I'm not going to die today. You're gambling, and you're gambling with some high stakes. You're gambling with your own soul because there's no guarantee of tomorrow, and there's no guarantee that Jesus won't come back today. And so we need to be ready. So if you're here today and are subject to the invitation of Christ, we urge you to come and obey the gospel, to be a Christian. And if you're an erring Christian, come back to the Lord and confess your sins. We'd be happy to pray with you and for you if that's your desire. But come now while we stand and while we sing.